Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to this Bayesian webinar on the sexual side effects of prostate cancer treatments. We will be recording this uh, meeting. So by continuing to stay logged in, you consent to the recording of the meeting. Um, and if not, then please, you can leave now. We will also be putting um, a recording of the meeting up on our uh, websites and Facebook page for people who weren't able to attend this evening. On behalf of the Prostate Cancer Foundation, uh, thank you for joining us um, and for this important subject. Just to remind you that we do have a website with extensive information about prostate cancer. We also have a Facebook page, Instagram, so please like and follow us on social media. Uh, that always helps us a lot. And then I do have to remind you of Suit Up September. September is Prostate Cancer Awareness Month. Uh, it's the month in which we try and raise awareness about prostate cancer just by asking people to set one day aside to suit up um, because not many of us wear suits anymore, whether it's in your organization, your company, uh, your sports club, um, and then buy one of our Suit Up September stickers off our online shop for 50 Rand. And then a reminder also of the Hollow Daredevil Run. This is our exec, all the men on our executive board, um, even at all of us uh, over the age of, well over the age of 50. Um, and we're in the Hollow Daredevil Speedos. Uh, this event is now countrywide and will be taking uh, place in September again. It's just a 5K run or walk. Um, and it's a great fun way for us to raise awareness about prostate and testicular cancer. I'd just like to welcome all our panelists and thank them um, for making time this evening to participate in this webinar, um, starting uh, with Dr. Yere Serfontaine, who's a medical sexologist. Um, so for those of you who are, are not sure in terms of the difference, um, she is a medical doctor, but she has um, trained and achieved a master's degree in um, sexual health in Australia. Uh, and then Helen Shaw is our physiotherapist who specializes in dealing with uh, men's um, uh, problems related to urinary incontinence and erectile dysfunction. And welcome to Dr. Uh, Georges de Milano. He's the vice chairman of our uh, medical and scientific advisory board and a radiation oncologist. And then last but not least, Dr. Peter Spies, um, who's a urologist from Tigerberg and University of Stellenbosch. Uh, and he heads up the uh, multidisciplinary team there that deals with prostate cancer. So we have a very well qualified um, board this evening um, to assist us with this uh, sometimes tricky subject um, that uh, patients face in terms of dealing with sexual side effects from prostate cancer treatment. So just a bit of anatomy 101 because it is quite important. Um, and then as you go through the slides, we'll stop and I'll, I'll ask our panelists to, to help us with some of the issues. Um, as most men know, um, the penis and the, the testicles are the external sexual organs. Um, not all men know what the internal sexual organs are and what they do. The very important prostate gland and the seminal vesicles, those two glands actually make uh, most of the ejaculate or seminal fluid, only 2% of which is made up of sperm, which is made in the uh, testicles. That prostate is a little bit inconveniently situated under the bladder because the tube that carries urine out of the body goes straight through it. So any problems with an enlarged prostate uh, or prostate cancer uh, can cause what we call cause what we call urinary symptoms um, by blocking that uh, tube or the urethra there. Um, it is a little bit more conveniently situated because it can be felt um, when a doctor inserts a finger up the rectum, um, they're able to feel the prostate there. And I know that's a, a test that, that sparks fear in many men's hearts. Um, so that's kind of the sexual anatomy that we're dealing with. There is some more complex anatomy uh, that we'll get into a little bit later in terms of sexual function. But I think um, just to understand that this uh, whole mechanism is actually made for reproduction and not necessarily necessary pleasure. Uh, and it's so finely tuned that we even have a gland that uh, secretes a little bit of fluid when men get aroused and clears out the acidity from the urine, the bulbar urethral gland, uh, that little drop of pre-cum uh, when you get aroused there. So very finely tuned. Um, one of the tricky things about the prostate is the nerve supply um, because the nerves that surround the prostate, which were only uh, actually kind of discovered back in 1982, um, run, are the same nerves that provide us with our erections. Um, so that's problematic because if those nerves are in any way damaged through um, surgery, um, through radiation treatments, or because prostate cancer has spread to them, it's going to have an impact on, on our uh, ability to achieve erections after uh, treatments. 
So perhaps to um, start with, I think one of the things that uh, hopefully urologists are doing um, is just checking sexual function before treatment. And maybe we'll hand over to our um, doctor who specialized in sexual health just to tell us a bit about uh, the kind of uh, different areas of sexual uh, desire arousal and orgasm and, and what they mean. Over to you, Dr. Serfontaine. Okay. Um, firstly, um, if we look at, well, well, I just want to emphasize this. Usually what I tell my patients, when we look at sexual dysfunctions, you need to understand what normal sexuality is and what normal sexual function looks like so that you can identify abnormality. So if we look at your um, sexual desire, that is your, or libido, that's the drive, the desire to have sex. And that's a fine balance between excitement and inhibition. So we talk about the dual model. And if there is enough exciting factors, um, you enjoy the visuals that you're looking at, you are very um, stimulated and you have little inhibiting factors, then you have a high desire. But anything that can have effect on your inhibitions, worrying about your erection, relationship issues, work stress, any inhibiting factor can actually suppress the excitement and that can have a negative effect on the desire. So the desire is self-explanatory, just the desire to have um, a sexual activity or engage in sexual activity. Then the arousal is the process of getting and maintaining erection, exactly what it says there. And um, you don't always necessarily to have the desire first for you to become aroused, because sometimes the desire can be a response of sexual desire, meaning that once there's stimulation, you will get aroused. And then because of the arousal, that causes um, the development of a response of desire. And then um, after arousal, and if you can actually maintain the erection, hopefully, um, and you don't necessarily have to have a strong erection to get to an orgasm. And there's a difference between an orgasm and ejaculation. So an orgasm is the peak of the sexual tension. And the ejaculation is actually the um, ejaculatory fluid coming out. So that is when we look at all those different factors, how they come into play. Um, so I hope that covers what you wanted, Andrew. Thanks very much, Dr. Serfontaine. Um, perhaps then a question for our urologist, because um, this is kind of the gatekeepers in terms of prostate cancer. If your um, PSA was high, you would have been referred to a urologist or urology department for further investigation. Um, they will have explained to you your different options. And um, is it common practice, Dr. Spies, that sexual function is actually evaluated um, before the treatments are actually administered? Hi, Andrew, and to the rest of the panel. Um, yes, Andrew, it's, it's actually, whether it's common practice, um, I'm well, unfortunately able to answer for other units, uh, but in our unit, is, it is common practice. Um, it, it's crucially important to know exactly what the baseline function is before you go into treatment. Um, uh, and, and the reason is because it may influence the patient's decision on the type of treatment that he wants. Um, and also whether the patient um, had a specific treatment or not to evaluate objectively afterwards uh, where we stand uh, with the, the, the erectile function. A lot of patients um, after the treatment um, would have subjectively have a, a decrease in their sexual function. And, and just by using uh, scores that is um, validated, for example, the one that you've got on the screen, the IIEF5 questionnaire, uh, one can actually show to the, the patient that Look, your this is the quantity of, of, of how much your sexual function has decreased, and more importantly, to use it as a baseline for gradual improvement and rehabilitation of your sexual function afterwards. So it's a long way to say yes, it's crucial, and it, it, it probably should be done. Um, if it's if your urologist is not doing it, um, please ask him to do so. Thanks very much. I think that was a, a great answer. I just think going back to our, our, our nerves there, as we as we're going to looking at different treatment options. Um, obviously, if, if if we don't have nerve supply, if the nerves are damaged in any way, um, that's going to be problematic. So most men who have, have tuned in tonight are, are prostate cancer survivors. They have undergone treatment. Um, they will recall that uh, the process started with a prostate biopsy. Uh, after their biopsy, um, they were given a Gleason grading score and. Um, 
certainly uh, there's quite a few guys from uh, Dr. Conrad Millman's RELP um, patient support group that are attending tonight and, and they, they're all very aware of their Gleason score and kind of have a, a reasonable understanding of the implications of that um, in terms of uh, it being a predictor for um, cancer that's likely to spread and be more aggressive. Um, and guys will often know their actual tumor staging as well. Uh, and, and if the cancer has been caught in the early stages before it has spread out of the prostate, um, the outcomes are much more favorable. If it's already spread to generally the seminal vesicles first, the T3, we call that locally advanced prostate cancer. And then we will get into a little bit um, of uh, advanced prostate cancer when the cancer is actually broken out of the prostate capsule. It's spread not only to the surrounding area in the pelvis, but it's gotten into the uh, blood vessels or the lymph vessels and it starts to spread all around the body. Um, and hopefully if you were diagnosed with localized cancer, the different treatment options um, were presented to you. Um, those of you who chose not to have any treatment because you had a, um, a, a low risk prostate cancer or an intermediate risk um, and chose active surveillance, um, will still be enjoying um, full sexual function as good as it was before. Um, but I think most of the guys who have joined us tonight have had active treatments, um, either surgery to remove the prostate um, and surgery can be done through an open um, prostatectomy where the, an incision is made in the abdomen. It can be done through small keyholes using laparoscopic um, uh, cameras and instruments or as more commonly is done nowadays, uh, robotic assisted laparoscopic prostatectomy. Um, or you may have opted for radiation therapy. We do have some um, patients who join us tonight and will be joining us who opted to have external beam radiation or brachytherapy. Um, and then some patients tonight will also um, have been diagnosed at a point when the cancer had actually advanced or um, the initial treatments uh, were not success, that successful and they've had to have further treatment, salvage therapy, uh, or they were initially diagnosed with quite high risk disease. So we're just dealing with um, guys who have opted for different treatment options. And I think um, perhaps the first question, because um, I know the, that uh, Dr. Spies works um, at Tigerberg and they've recently acquired a robotic to be able to do robotic prostatectomies, although they all will also still perform open. Is there a benefit uh, for guys who have opted to have the robotic prostatectomy uh, in terms of uh, sexual side effects after treatment, Dr. Spies? Andrew, um, so when you go look at the big studies um, that's been done, um, the, the comparative between open and, and robotic um, needs to take on a surgeon to surgeon basis. Now the open radical prostatectomy is only done um, in about 15% of cases worldwide. Um, in South Africa, it still, still makes up quite a large percentage of the amount of radical prostatectomies that we do. Um, and the comparisons that is done is usually on expert level. So the comparisons in the main study would take an, an expert, meaning that's a, a, a surgeon who's done usually more than 500 cases of a specific operation, and they'll compare it with an expert uh, on the other technique. And interestingly enough, when you take two complete experts, and it's usually high number, high volume centers, there's very little difference when it comes to nerve sparing um, the, 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 the surgeons with high volume numbers of open prostatectomies can do a nerve sparing very similar to that that a robotic surgeon that's an expert as well can do. Where the difference really comes in is when it comes to lower number cases. When surgeons with slightly lower numbers that doesn't have that amount of numbers, the robotic um, in, 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 rob in robotic surgery, it seems like there is a slight improvement in preservation of sexual dysfunction. Um, and the main reason for that and speculation for that is that there's just a significantly better vision during the operation to try and identify that very fine nerves that run on the, on the posterior lateral aspects on the sides of the, of the prostate and, and attempting to spare them. Um, it's also just crucial to note that it's not always feasible or, or a good um, cancer uh, principle to try and sp spare them. So it's in a very isolated group of, of patients that we can actually actively try to spare that cancer. Uh, you just showed the different stagings uh, and the different stagings, T1, T2, T3. Um, and in certain instances, look, the first priority 
when you do the operations, obviously we want to cure you from the cancer. And it's a fine balance to decide, are we going to try and spare this nerve or are we going to try and get the whole cancer out? Um, and, and the margins are literally in millimeters. Um, and so that also needs to be taken into account. A lot of times the surgeon will try and spare one side, maybe the side that's less affected by the cancer, and then take a wide resection, including the nerves on the other side. Um, to answer your question, the short answer to your question, um, I think in the South African setting where we don't have that high volume uh, numbers uh, in, in, uh, at this stage um, in open, and we've got some guys that's got doing high volumes in, in robotic um, that's been doing it since the start. Um, I think the, 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 the slight advantage is in the vicinity of, of the robot. But when you look at the, the studies that's out there, very little differences are shown. Sorry, Andrew, I think you need to unmute. Yeah. So thanks very much, Dr. Spies. Maybe a question for our um, radiation oncologist. So some patients will have um, opted to have brachytherapy um, or external be beam radiation. Um, and I know there's a lot of debate about this. Uh, is one of these treatment options um, likely to cause less uh, erectile dysfunction than the other? Dr. De Merlinar, maybe you can assist. If you just unmute, remember to unmute yourself first, please. Maybe um, Dr. Spies, while Dr. De Merlin, I was just um, sorting out his tech there. Do you have any uh, uh, information for our, our patients who are, are listening this evening? So um, brachytherapy does have a, a um, definitely a little bit of an advantage when it comes to prostatectomy in those low risk groups um, uh, that get brachytherapy. Uh, I see Dr. De Merlin is, is unmuted now. Maybe you can take over. Uh, but Definitely advantage to brachytherapy uh, when it comes to sexual function. It's just based on, on the mechanism of how it works. You, you, the brachytherapy is designed to radiate the prostate from the inside. And, and when you, a proper planning is done, you minimize any radiation that is external to it. Doesn't mean that uh, erectile dysfunction cannot take place uh, in patients with brachytherapy. It's still, there's a, still a significant incidence of it. But compared to, uh, to prostatectomy, there is a, a slight advantage. Dr. De Merlinar, anything to add to that? No, I've got uh, lots and lots of experience with external beam therapy. And in my cases that I followed up for a minimum of five years, about just over 20% had lost their sexual function. Eight, almost 80% could still uh, uh, function pro uh, normally for sexual function. And in brachytherapy is very much the same, the same figure, but of course it, it all depends on how active they were before you, start, you, you treat an 85 year old man, there is very little activity in any case. So, uh, but the th radiotherapy does not harm the nerves. Nerves are very resistant to radiation. Okay. Great, thank you very much, Dr. De Merlinar. Um, perhaps, uh, I think we've touched on quite a lot of this, obviously before treatment, um, the patient's erectile function is very important um, and whether they've had to, as Dr. Spies pointed out, have nerve bundles removed on either one side or both sides uh, or a completely nerve sparing um, procedure. And then the type of surgery uh, doesn't seem like there's that much difference. Um, but perhaps a question for um, our, our sexual health doctor and our physio. Um, early other factors that perhaps influence sexual function after treatment, maybe early rehabilitation to oxygenate and prevent damage, um, patient's motivation, um, just starting that penile rehabilitation uh, early. Any comments uh, maybe from Dr. Serfentain and our physio, Helen Shaw? Well, I definitely think that early um, penile rehabilitation is crucial. And um, Helen's got years of experience with um, rehabilitation and working with patients actually prior to it even. So I think Helen, you are the right person to answer this. Okay, yeah, I, I try to see patients for weeks before um, surgery, but I know that's in a first world situation. Uh, but during that time, I certainly asked them about their erection function and uh, uh, some British physios, I was on a, a, a 
discussion a few weeks ago kind of said, well, how do you talk about erections? I said, you just do it. Mm -hmm. I just say, are you as a couple still sexually active? I do try as far as possible to do couple therapy, or if there's the man's there, you know, are you and your partner still sexually active? And then I ask about the erection function to also um, establish the bar level. And that gives me the um, diplomacy to move forward. So I'm not, if I think, well, PSA is really high, things aren't looking so good, your erections are getting a four out of 10. I'm gonna be very cautious in what I say. But if all the markers are looking good, then I will certainly give them hope and already prior to surgery, explain to them uh, what I do and how I do sexual, help them and educate them in sexual um, rehabilitation. So, um, and sometimes I even can explain what I, how I use outer course and I explain, I explain to them and, and encourage them to try and even try this at home. Uh, and um, so we try to get their motivation up uh, before they even start. And then I, I have uh, developed a bit of a timeline for patients. So obviously patients are free to make their own decisions, but I've had at least uh, 14 patients have full penetrative sex 12 days post-surgery, and that to me is, is not good. That is uh, um, the, 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 the structures of the penis, the delicate structures of the penis need to repair before they can rehabilitate. And I feel quite strongly about that. So I now kind of put out a timeline for patients and say, this is what I suggest. And on day 14, we start with um, what I call a shower routine. So the warm, warm water and soap routine with lots of touching, lots of touching of the glands of the penis, lots of touching of the shaft of the penis. If the patient is circumcised, he's got to pull back uh, you know, the foreskin and get the, the glands exposed. And then uh, I take that off also a little bit of dry work as well, not just in the shower. So they increase that over the next week. And then on day 21, they can start with a partner. And then that is more uh, aggressive in terms of sexual rehabilitation. So they start with a bit of oral sex, a bit of um, touching sex, a bit of using this beautiful U-shaped uh, vibrator, which can be worked up the, up the sides of the penis, split open, worked on the sides here like this. It has a very soft, one very soft side, which can be used on the glands of the penis. This side vibrates more, more um, aggressively. And so then that can be used on the dorsal nerve at the side here. So we start that then on day 21. Um, and this obviously is in uh, with medication. So they've usually been on medication. Where patients have had both nerves spared, and I've explained all this to them beforehand. Some of them have Googled a lot and are very uh, educated, them, have educated themselves, but a lot come in very ignorant still. So I explained to them about the full nerve sparing, the unilateral, the non-nerve sparing. And then um, where they have only one nerve has been saved, I explained to them about nerve rehabilitation, how nerves rehabilitate at five millimeters a week, if there is at least three times a week uh, input to, to, to create stimulation. And that is very important that they're not going to think that, that if they don't do anything, if they don't actively work towards it, something's gonna happen. So I say three times a week, is necessary for fairly aggressive, not aggressive in painful sense, but a time, yes, working towards getting rehabilitation. And, um, and so I, I sort of equate that to, a, which works very well to, I say to them, I trained 40 years ago, I still learned about polio. If I have a boy who, who's in a wheelchair and the doctor says, right, his spine's fixed now, he can walk. If I don't get him up and do a lot of work with him, He's never going to walk in the eyes sort of line. You know, I understand that. And I really do encourage them to go out and do a lot of work. But then I also say to the men, it's not just up to you and your partner. It's not, uh, you need to do quite a lot of it yourself. So I work a lot towards them doing um, self-stimulation, uh, working towards having um, orgasms without um, erections. So working towards, I tend to think of the orgasm word as being the build up to the climax, but actually what Jiro said just now, and it's true, I have kind of read more documentation about that, and actually the orgasm is the pinnacle of the build up, and I'm not quite sure what I need to call that build up, sort of sexual activity, but that's not enough, because sexual activity is much broader than that. But then I also say to my patients, absolutely, sexual activity is not just about 
a penis. Sexual activity is about the whole body. It's about the whole sensate focus sense of excitation. It's your kissing, your touching, your coffee in the morning, your compliments. It's, it's your brain sex is hugely important. And I, I, I give a lot of emphasis on that, that it's not just, hello, here we are down at the penis. Let's put some stimulation on the penis. It's much, much more than that. Thanks very much, Ellen, for that detailed but explanation. I, I think, <laughs> I think um, um, we'll move on to maybe looking at some of the things that you brought up uh, in your discussion there in terms of um, first-line treatment options um, using uh, PDE5 inhibitors for our, our patients who um, don't know what PDE5s are. Those would typically be um, your drugs like uh, Viagra, Levitra, Cialis and, and there's many generics uh, options available for them now, uh, or the uh, vacuum constriction device or using those in, in combination. And, and I'll open it to all to our panelists, maybe our, our urologist, uh, Dr. Spies and Dr. Serpentine to just um, tell us a little bit about how they utilize those in terms of first um, options for, for um, treating erectile dysfunction post um, surgery or post brachy. Um, yeah, I think of, I think Dr. Spish should um, firstly jump in here because typically what I, um, unfortunately, I only see the patients a few years after um, the surgeries and then they um, been through everything and then we're struggling to um, get back to the erectile function. So I think Dr. Spish should maybe just jump in here talking about um, the immediate um, medical care after surgery and then I'll see if I can add to that. Um, so, Andrew, this is um, unfortunately a very controversial topic. Um, it's not as straightforward as we would want it to be. Um, we all, and we were really hoping that the, this that was out there is going to show us that early initiation of PDE5 is going to make a massive difference. And unfortunately, the studies has been not great. <laughs> it's, it's actually been quite disappointing. Um, the studies has been out there. So from an evidence-based medicine, uh, you know, I actually asked this question to our final years uh, in their exam a year and a half ago. They were quite upset with me because it's such a controversial issue and there's no evidence supporting it. Um, so it's very difficult to motivate it to medical aids and especially the public sector if there's no evidence backing it up. So unfortunately, in the government sector, we are not we don't have the, the, the resources to give patients PDE5s after surgery. As you know, PDE5s, despite generics being out, is still quite expensive and our, our standard patient cannot afford them. So we do not routinely do PDE5 rehabilitation after surgery. Anecdotally, for patients who can afford it in private, um, we usually start them, I, uh, you know, explain to them, listen, there's anecdotal evidence that this may work. The large studies show, unfortunately, no benefit, uh, but you're welcome to give it a try. And what you usually then do is Cialis. Um, I, I use the, long, uh, the longer acting one, uh, and we usually just start off with a five milligram dose daily, um, and then also then get the, the physiotherapists involved to work with the patients. Um, and that's where you sometimes get the best results. Uh, but from a, a strictly academic point of view, unfortunately, it's very contentious. Thank you. Maybe, Helen, you can just jump in here because we've put there as one of the first line options and possibly a combination of a PD-5 and a, and a vacuum uh, erectile yeah. device or vacuum yeah. constriction device. Do you find them yeah. useful in your, in your practice? Yeah. Are you talk, do I find what the vacuum vacuum, vacuum devices yeah. very useful? Yeah, I, I didn't initially when I first started this six years ago, and I realized that my mistake was I was just kind of as you often happens, just handing a patient, you know, go down the road to the pharmacy and buy one and not giving them instruction about it. And then they ended up in the bedroom cupboard and not in the bedside table. And uh, patients were frustrated that they'd spent so much on them. They cost about 1,700, 1,800. But now I've done a, quite a bit of uh, feedback with patients and worked with patients in terms of different ideas. And I've also liaised with other physios that work with men in this country. And, and um, I start with, 
I see you said 10 minutes. I slash that. I start with four pumps first day, second day, four pumps, third day, four pumps, four second rest, four pumps. And we start very slowly to prepare the penis for the, 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 the trauma and all the, 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 the different feeling of an erection happening with a vacuum pump. It is different. We know physiologically it's different uh, in terms of the blood flow as well, but, um, but also just preparing the penis for what it's gonna do. And I say to patients starting with a vacuum pump is walking across a rugby field and you need to take two weeks to, to, to gear yourself to get getting an erection. And so we, and there's got to be a pump and then a break for as many seconds as there were, were pumps. And, and pump being, I mean, a single pump like this, I'm not sure if you know the, the vacuerect, it, it works with a, um, where you, you're doing this. So one, two, three, four, rest, two, three, and actually the elongation of the penis happens more in those rest times than in the pump times and the patient will be pumping madly if he's not been educated and not getting his erection and he'll do more pumps and then he actually does damage to the very delicate structures and he then he then has pain afterwards and so then the pump gets thrown into the bottom of the cupboard with the old boots and so it's very important that you don't have advertisements that say, have an erection in 30 seconds. You will have your best sex. I think unfortunately we lost Helen a bit there because of the load shedding. So maybe I'll move on to- um, Sex tonight or whatever. That needs to, I feel quite strongly about that. Helen, we lost you for a Hello. minute there. So have you still lost me? Yeah. No, you on, you're back on. Uh, okay. So anyway, that's enough about pumps, but I'm just saying they need an education with them as well. And then, um, uh, yeah, we, we um, but, but move on to the further things. If, if patients are battling, so I look at patients with, uh, with both nerves spared, Within three weeks, we're starting with tingling. Within four weeks, we're getting semi-erections. Within five weeks, six weeks, hopefully we're having penetration. Where there is one nerve, as I sort of alluded to earlier, it has to be more aggressive. It's got to be at least three times a week. And that then we're looking at about a two months before we start with our more semi where the patients will report the penis feels swollen and the tingling can go on for longer period of time before we move on to that sort of slight semi erection and then the the, the this time of the semis takes longer and longer where there is one nerve but certainly within four four months three to four months we hope to have penetration but, um, but before that time, I, I put a lot of stress that penetration isn't necessary, that your outer course is terribly important. And I encourage patients to do oral sex, handwork sex, and positional sex, and to keep up with that in terms of firing up the neuromuscular rehabilitation. And then, what, just incidentally, while I'm speaking on that, if a patient has had non-nerve sparing, and they're very too keen to go on with their sexual activity, I actually educate them to have um, erections, um, orgasms without erections as a alternate forms of form of sex, which they can take forward. And as one patient said to me, in other words, it's a reciprocal uh, pleasuring of each other. He pleasures her with external clitoral um, stimulation or internal stimulation. She she pleasures him with outer course stimulation. And so we change the way that sex is done for patients that wish to move forward with sex. But I also say to all my patients, sexual, sexual intimacy is not about penetration. It's much, much bigger than that. Great. Thanks, Helen. Maybe a question for Dr. Spies and Dr. Serfentain. If um, those uh, PD files are, are not working, it's a little bit further down the line, uh, injectable uh, therapies are available. How successful are they? How easy are they to use? And how easy is it to find a doctor that will um, pres prescribe them and, and teach patients to use them? Well, um, I'm not exactly sure in the um, in the um, public sector, but in private sector, it's um, it's easily available on a prescription. The only concern is 
that the CAB eject is not currently available in South Africa. Um, the, it's coming and going, but with the compounded pharmacies, you can get um, either Biomix or Trimix, which is a combination of alprosidol with either um, papaverine or clopribazine, and um, that is effective. And the nice thing about the compounded um, intracavernous injections is we can actually increase the dose according to the response. It's easy to use, it's not that painful, and um, the only side effect is that the alprostadol can actually cause painful erections. It's not that the injection side itself is painful, but because of the alprostadol, there's pain, but um, with the Trimix, for instance, you can decrease the dose of the alprostadol to decrease the risk of those side effects and increase the dose of the other two components. So yeah, so it is available, it is effective, um, it's easy to use. Dr. Spies, anything to add to injectables? Yes, um, yes. so the, the intracorporeal injections is actually significantly more effective than PDE-5s when it comes to post-prostatectomy patients. Um, the post, the PDE-5, um, only about 25% of them is effective in cases where what we call neurogenic erectile dysfunction. Neurogenic means there's the nerves or the, 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 the you know, the the nerves or the nerve damage is the reason for the erectile dysfunction. Uh, and in those cases, they're only 25% effective. Um, in, in patients who's had neurogenic, meaning that it's nerve-related erectile dysfunction, your first line of therapy is actually your intracorporal injections, similar to your paraplegic patients. In paraplegic patients, the first line of treatment is intracorporal injections because they bypass the nerves. Um, so it is a, the most effective way of getting erections after radical prostatectomy. And in a lot of instances, you get really good uh, effect with them. In the government sector, we actually, um, we've got a, the Rosagam Pharmacy just across the road here yeah, in, in Paro in Cape Town. So we, uh, we actually buy it for our patients and they can get it at cost price at our unit. Uh, and we, majority of our patients use the ICIs. I think the most important for the patients here is that at least your first injection should be demonstrated to you um, and you should be counseled properly on how to do this injection um, by a doctor. It's not something you buy with a prescription, go home, Google and do it. Um, so we, as a routine, we get our patients in, we demonstrate the do's and the don'ts regarding this injection. Um, and then also the, what are the, the potential side effects or the negative effects is that you have to be looking out for. Um, yeah, we, we've unfortunately, uh, I, I know there's, there's good doctors out there doing it. We've had with certain of these, you know, clinics that, that run mass injections, we've had a bit of problems with complications. Um, so just make sure that you, you, you get counseled very well on the use of it. If you use it properly, you use the right dose it's very effective. If you use it wrongly, things can turn out uh, disastrously. No, just something maybe, um, to touch on is, um, I mentioned the one side effect being the pain, but the other side effect of the injectables is a priapism where the erection doesn't go away. And um, if we look at the things that can actually increase the chances of a priapism, it's if you've got PDF5 inhibitors on board, certain antidepressants like bupropion or Wellbutrin, and I can imagine um, going through a um, radiation or um, chemotherapy or cancer survivor, there's a big possibility that they might be on antidepressants and things like that can actually increase the risks of um, a priapism. So it's just yeah, something to talk to your doctor and understand that if the erection doesn't go away, um, it's not a bargain, <laughs> rather go to the emergency unit or see someone um, to assist with that. Great, thanks. Um, Dr. Smith, just a question. So am I understanding, and for our patients out there, if, if they haven't uh, been able to spare uh, any of the nerves on either side of the, the prostate, would this be in fact first line therapy for them? Um, uh, and yeah. something that they, if they're not getting help straight away, they should yes. be talking to uh, their surgeon Definitely. About. I think the first line treatment, I, I told patients, look, you're welcome to take a PD-5, but there's, you're going to waste, there's a 75% chance you're going to waste your money. So uh, they're welcome to try the tablets. I, the question is how many tablets do you need to use before you decide it's a failure of, of medication? Um, it's, it's very different 
in, in just a regular patient that comes with erectile dysfunction than a patient post-operatively. So I, um, I recommend that they start off with intracorporeal injections. It's much more effective. Um, and the majority of our patients use it very well. And then maybe just to touch on for those patients in whom the injections don't even work, uh, there is still hope. And I always say to guys, if you have a dread disease um, policy, don't spend it on a trip to Mauritius. You might need it for one of these uh, in, our, in our lower picture there. That's a penile implant. Um, is this a feasible treatment? Is it available in South Africa? And does it work, uh, Dr. Spies? Yes, um, it's, it's, it's available in South Africa. It is uh, done in South Africa. We are a few surgeons in the country, all over the country, who does this procedure. Um, it's very effective. I think, um, look, it's always a last option. Uh, and let's be clear about that. Um, surgery of this magnitude, putting in penile prosthesis, is always the last option. Um, it's not something to replace the others. You always go through the steps. You go through your, you know, through your tablets and through your injections. And if that doesn't work, this is the, the route to go. Um, the implants, um, obviously, the limiting factor here is obviously cost uh, regarding to the implants. Um, and we are fighting the good fight with the medical aids. We actually have another, as a, as a working group, we've got another meeting now in August. Uh, that we are working with suppliers. There's two suppliers in the country and, and trying to get medical aids on board. Um, there's some of the medical aids who you can get this via your oncological benefit. Uh, I mean, I think it's just fair. If you, can get a, um, if you can get a breast implant after a mastectomy, you should be able to have access to prosthesis like this as well. So we're fighting that fight with the medical aids. Um, but uh, we've got very high uh, patient satisfactory rates, 90% patient, 90% uh, patient satisfactory rates, and even interestingly enough, higher partner satisfaction rates. The price of partner satisfaction rates is about 95%, uh, which is interesting. But um, yes, it's very good. It's very effective. Um, the technology has improved. This has been, a, just for interest's sake, this has been around since the early 80s uh, when the first implants were done, and the technology has improved significantly. It's the same company still doing it. Um, and the mechanical failure rates on these have, have gone down significantly. You can easily get 10, 15 years out of this without any problems. Um, so it's a very good procedure. It's a very good device. Um, and um, always questions around this device is, doesn't it, you know, don't, it doesn't take away on the sensation. Doesn't it take away the, uh, um, your sensation, your orgasm, all of that completely remains intact. Um, this is, the cylinders are just, implanted into the, the corpora cavernosa, which is the erectile bodies. Um, they are implanted, they're inflatable. You've got a little pump that we implant in your scrotum. It sits in between the testes like a third testicle. Uh, and essentially you, you uh, will activate the pump, give it two or three pumps and water is then pumped from that reservoir that's implanted in that space next to the bladder and it, uh, you cause an erection. And after ejaculation and orgasm, uh, well, usually it's just an orgasm, it's, there's no ejaculate, um, but then what will happen is you will just deflate the pump again, and um, yeah, it's erection on demand. Sounds like a fantastic uh, accessory for guys who are battling and, and not coming uh, right with other treatment options. Maybe just touching on um, a group of patients who have advanced prostate cancer or have had to have androgen deprivation therapy and just to uh, remind the guys that prostate cancer obviously needs testosterone to grow. Uh, if it is advanced, um, that needs to be taken away uh, either by removing the testicles, which is our testosterone factory. Um, testosterone is a wonderful hormone, gives, gives us our sex drive, our, our nighttime and waking erections, provides men with energy and drive and a general sense of well being and drive, regulates the function of our, our sex organs maintains our lean muscle mass and our, maintains our muscle strength and promotes bone density. Um, if we have to remove testosterone through what we call androgen deprivation therapy or hormone therapy, as it's sometimes referred to, uh, we must keep in mind that normal testosterone levels um, are above 12 nanomoles per liter. We measure testosterone in the morning before 11 a.m. Um, intermediate testosterone levels, 8 to 12. Um, Dr. Serfontaine, when would a man start experiencing, uh, and this is not a patient who's on androgen deprivation therapy, but normal men who have low testosterone, when would they start experiencing symptoms at what sort of testosterone levels? Usually, um, if the testosterone is below 12, then we start seeing symptoms um, 
are the, the sexual dysfunctions, the loss of desire, erectile dysfunction, or just feeling fatigued, um, loss of vigor. Um, yeah, so usually between eight and 12, we start treating if there's symptoms. And that's- So I guess that uh, uh, androgen deprivation therapy uh, aims to get testosterone below uh, 1.7. So we can certainly expect some drastic changes. And, and even now we're redefining that level um, to be below 0.7, uh, which is achievable. Um, we use, can use medical um, uh, medicines and injections to bring that testosterone down, but um, I'm guessing there's some uh, side effects and, and maybe you can just um, uh, walk us through some of those things that guys can expect. Um, I'll open the, the floor up to Dr. Spies and Dr. Serfente. Okay, um, I just want to see the slides. My screen, the video is okay. So, yes, obviously, if there's a lack of testosterone, um, we are going to experience a lot of things the loss of the desire, um, erectile dysfunction. Um, but at, in essence, the, you know, the desire is, like I said, it's a combination of a few things. So we need testosterone for excitability and for spontaneous desire. But if we can actually just move past that around the spontaneity around it, we can actually focus more on the responsive desire. And even without testosterone, you can do that. So um, unfortunately, loss of testosterone can lead to a lot of um, sexual difficulties, but it's something that you can um, overcome if you just work um, in a multidisciplinary team and speak to um, either a medical sexologist or a, um, go for psychotherapy just to work on those inhibiting things and see what you can do to improve the excitability and decrease the inhibitions and then if the desire is better everything else can fall into place because there's other things we can use to get erections um the orgasm can still be there so um yeah i hope that makes sense dr speech just in terms of the physical changes that men can expect who are put on to androgen deprivation therapy having their testosterone removed um, are these quite common and, and how do they affect men psychologically? Yeah, um, it's, it's, there's, it, testosterone, I always explain to the medical students, is, it's one of those very interesting hormones where you, we, don't, we don't exactly know how it functions, but we do exactly know what happened when it's not there. It's got a finger in every pie. Um, we don't know how it influences what it does, but we know exactly what happens when it's not there, and it's very prominent. So um, testosterone, the physical changes, obviously men can suddenly struggle to, with obesity, um, the muscular, the muscle, muscle mass decreases. A lot of patients tell me, yes, I'm, I'm, I used to be very active and I was able to cycle up Table Mountain and, and, and hike up, and now I just, I don't have the energy to do it. Um, there's the psychological component of it. People, uh, a lot of men experience a depression um, and a change in their, their outlook and arts, you know, um, and life, which, which also shows us testosterone has got an influence on mental health, um, which previously we, we didn't know. Um, it, it obviously, there's some other physical changes. Um, because of the, the decrease in testosterone, um, there is um, some, every man has a little bit of estrogen in the body as well. And, and what can happen is now with the predominance of estrogen, you can have breast um, um, uh, development taking place or man boobs as it's called. Um, uh, you uh, can have some thinning of the hair, uh, thinning of facial hair, you can have a um, slight decrease, um, a subjective decrease in, 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 in testicular size or, or penile size. But um, for the majority of the time, a lot of men just uh, you know, come to you and say, I'm uh, oh, sorry, one of the other important ones is hot flashes. So uh, you get significant hot flashes. And probably that is in the beginning, the symptom that bothers men the most is uh, they say, I, I'm, I'm trying, I'm sounding like my wife at this stage. <laughs> the, wife, the, the wives have very little sympathy with me and just say, yes, now you know how I feel. But it's, it's typical hot flashes in the middle of the night, wake up in a sweat, um, and that's probably the symptom in the beginning that's, that's the most bothersome. But luckily, it's treatable, um, and there's medication that we can give to, to decrease the effect of the hot flashes. Um, yeah, but mostly the men will come to you and, and, and they will tell you, look, I just, that little the drive and that oomph that I had, the power that I had, the stuff that make me feel like a man, it, it, it's, it's diminished. 
um, and, and we we starting to 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 figure out the massive impact that testosterone had. Obviously, this is different for each patient. I mean, when you when we get patients a diagnosis who's got a lot of metastases and spread all over to the bones and then significant pain and and you do you take away the testosterone, their immediate feelings they if after four weeks they feel ten times better than they did. So it all depends on what's your baseline. You know, where do you come from? Um, uh, in patients that so the, the idea these days we, we try not to do it too early we sometimes we try and just hang back on the testosterone uh, before we take it away um, and and only take it away when it's really indicated when there's spread of disease when there's significant risk of uh, high risk disease that's got a, a significant um, risk in, in metastasizing in those cases, we, it is shown to, to improve your overall survival. So then it's, it's, it's a trade-off between two evils. Maybe a question for Dr. Serfontaine. I just think um, that men and their partners don't always realize the benefit of actual counseling um, who are going to be going through this before maybe the treatment even starts and then during the treatment when, it, when it's occurring and, and how important it is for them to re, maybe reframe their sexuality. Yeah, no, that's, that's crucial um, because all of the medical things can be addressed and there's, um, there's physiotherapists, there's medication, there's things that we can do. But the problem then often is that you've got, for instance, if you go for the Rolls Royce and you've got the um, penile pump, uh, penis pump and everything is fine, you've been negotiating this lack of desire, erectile dysfunction, there's not been anything going on and now all of a sudden we've got this fixed and now everything should just go back to normal. And it's not that easy to negotiate. And often the partner starts to withdraw because they don't want to put pressure on their partner. So they can see it's it's difficult. It's emotionally stressing. So they go, they develop a load of libido and it's this uh, sexual avoidance pattern. And it's very important, like Helen um, mentioned earlier, just to focus on the intimacy and if there's, I always tell my patients, sex is not all a relationship is about, but if it's not there, it's all the relationship issues go is, um, is about. So to see if you're in a good place and you can actually communicate about your needs, not just physical sexual needs, but emotional needs, because most of my patients, when I ask them, why do they have sex? It's because they want an emotional connection with their partner. And that emotional con connection can be met with other ways of um, physical touch as well. So if communication is fantastic, maybe it's going to be difficult to get someone to see a psychologist or go for counseling. But I think it should be part of base, baseline things to do. So it's really, really important to get to that point. Thanks very much. Um, um, I, th I think we'll, we've kind of covered mostly um, that uh, slide and we're getting to the end of our, uh, our session at this point. So um, anything to add, Dr. de Mullenau, Helen, uh, in terms of uh, things that I might have uh, not thought about? Yeah, can Helen? I come in? You haven't yes. talked about climate urea. So I'm very briefly just gonna say that is a huge problem when, when patients are getting back to sexual activity and a lot of the men want to withdraw from sexual activity because of climate urea. And I say to them, if you don't take your activity to the hard spot, if you don't learn to do the handbrake start on a hill, you will not master it and you will not get your driver's license. So you have to take your activity. You've got to work through that climate urea in order for the sphincter, the external sphincter, to learn its automatic reaction needs to shut at that time. So maybe so just we do a lot define of... climate urea for our, our, our Sorry, patients. Okay, yeah. Climate urea is, is urination with climax. So when climax happens, when the, the force of the climax happens, um, equivalent to the force of, sort of ejaculation, but there's no ejaculation, that is such a strong action that the sphincter isn't able, the external urethral sphincter isn't able to close and hold the urine back. But remember also that the external urethral sphincter's role was to open up, to let ejaculate through. So that external urethral sphincter has to first unlearn an action and then learn a new action to close off during sexual activity. So that is one of the last things. The other last thing is not leaking or farting, but that's not what tonight's about. So that is one of the last things that 
that patients sometimes master and men get terribly embarrassed about exposing their partner to 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 your urine and so i often i always bring this in as a discussion and we talk about urine and the sterility of urine as it comes out of the body and how necessary it is not to give up the activity because if you give up the activity you're not going to master it and there are ways of avoiding that um lots of a uh, fast twitch pelvic floor action um, 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 voiding, urinating before sexual activity. A condom can be used. And then we, we also get a tension loop, which has it's almost like one of those little drawstrings that you get on a, on a hoodie or at the side of a jacket with a little ball on it. And, and you can actually have made some for patients and you, you lift this little ball up under the urethra. So you've got a ring around the penis, but the urethra is blocked off and that does decrease the climaturia, and, and then every time they do the action, the automation of the sphincter comes in. And I think sometimes we don't think enough about the automation of the sphincter. And as a physio, I say to patients, you need to learn automation of your external sphincter, and that incorporates the strength. In other words, it's no good, I just help them strengthen, strengthen, strengthen the pelvic floor muscles, without bringing in automation. So automation is also a very important aspect. Great, thank you much, very much, Helen. And just for all those practical explanations, I think they were really useful. Uh, Dr. de Merlino, any final comments from yourself? No, thank you. Uh, Dr. Spies? Andrew, thanks. thanks for the initiative. I think we've covered a lot of topics and, and I think it was very valuable. Dr. Serpentine, thanks very much for your input. Any uh, closing comments from yourself? No, I think uh, no. I'm um, I'm just want to mention. Yeah, Helen touched a lot on it, but um, yeah, sexual dysfunction is common, and it's not something that you cannot overcome. And just maintaining intimacy is important. So that's just my final comment. <laughs> Great, and thanks. Thank you very much um, to all our um, patients from our patient support group and other patients that uh, dialed in tonight. Uh, this recording will be made available as well. Thanks also to our Prostate Cancer Foundation Vice Chairman St. Birkus for organizing all the IT tonight. And thank you to all of the panelists. We really appreciate you giving up your time. Um, I think patient education is just such an important uh, thing uh, and, and knowledge really does empower patients to, to um, go on and, and overcome the difficulties they're facing. Thank you very much. Uh, good night, everybody. Thanks. Good night.